All right. This week's reviewer of the week is Haley987416. And she says, incredible. These ladies give you all the details, tips, and tricks, the real truth about everything. So grateful. I am living abroad in Germany for my first birth, and I'm so happy my sister-in-law told me about you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Haley, for leaving that. I'm excited that you're here. I have another amazing woman on with me today. So if you're looking for more tips and tricks, I hope you're going to get that out of today's episode. Um, But before we get started and jump into this, well, let me just say, um, I'm excited about our guest today for a couple of reasons. First of all, she is a birth professional and birth magic worker from everything that I have heard from her. Um, But I kind of love our story about how we got connected. And so I I'm going to tell you about that. (laughs) So Courtney actually reached out to me in an email and was like, hey, you know this episode on GBS? She goes, I see some discrepancies. Like I agree with this and this, but I see this and this and this this way. And she had evidence to back it up. And I, I really was grateful for that. So I read through her very detailed, excellent email and it made me re listen to my GBS episode. So I'm either going to do one of two things. I'm either going to put a blurb at the front of that episode, which I just haven't had time to do because of moving and everything. But I'm either going to put a blurb that explains um, some of the things that I talked about and then possible discrepancies or things that I think women should be made aware of for the rest of that episode. Or I'm going to re-record it and either re-upload or do a separate episode on it. Um, I think a lot, I mean, the majority of the information is going to stay the same, but I think there were some crucial things in there that needed to be added. So uh, I loved that. But my other, the other side of this was I was like, she is so passionate about what she does. She seriously cares about women. She's, you can tell good at what she does and backs it up with evidence. And that's a really big deal to me. So I think it, I think I had sent one email and then I sent the next email real quick. Actually, how do you feel about joining me on the on the podcast because as I'm like sitting here thinking about it, I'm like other women need to hear from people like this. So I reached out to her and she was kind enough to say yes, (laughs) that she'd like to be here with me. So um, without further ado, will you take a moment, Courtney, and introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and what you do professionally. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me on here today. I'm super excited. Um, Like we discussed before in the original email, we're all here for the same reasons and that's to get evidence-based info into the hands of all of our mamas so that they can make the best decisions for themselves. So always happy to help with that. Um, So I am a labor and delivery nurse. We're going on three years now and I am a little over three years now. I'm also a certified breastfeeding counselor and I work in the hospital setting in a um, LDRP. So it's so labor, delivery, recovery, and postpartum unit, um, which I love because we kind of get to train in all the different kind of things. Um, I originally got my bachelor's degree in psychology. And then um, I had my son about a year after I graduated with that from Indiana University. And then I fell in love with my labor and delivery nurses. And prior to that time, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my first degree. And then like I said, fell in love with my L&D nurses. And I was like, that is what I want to do. Because I feel like a lot of people, when when I say I'm a labor and delivery nurse, they're like, oh, the babies, you do it for the babies. You get to snuggle all the babies. Babies are cool. I love babies just as much as the next person, but I'm in it for the moms. It's such a vulnerable, kind of like a raw time in your life. And just to be able to be there for women who are going through that and to support them through that, that's why I do it. So I had my son, he is eight, and then we moved down to Florida. So that's currently where I'm living and working with my husband and my eight-year-old. And I'm just about 39 weeks pregnant with my second. So that's exciting too, because I wasn't a labor and delivery nurse um, the first time around. So it's kind of, it's, it's got its pros and cons kind of, you're almost too close to that you know, when you're pregnant and working in the, in the field. Um, but I'm super passionate about all things women's health and labor and delivery, childbirth education, and I can't imagine working in any other field of nursing. I love it. Yeah. I, as you were saying that, I'm like, okay, this question's not on our interview outline, but now I'm really curious because I had that same situation of like, I am a birth nerd and I am a doula and I am in women's spaces, but then we were trying to get pregnant and I straight up had to like pull back and say, I was only going to take certain kinds of births or with certain kinds of providers, like for my own sanity as I was pregnant. So what has that been like for you? Um, honestly, I feel, uh, I don't know. It kind of goes in phases. Like, 
you know, one week I'll feel like I've got this totally under control and everything is normal and fine. And, and then the next week I'll be Googling things that like, I almost already know, but I have, but I'm still like obsessively Googling. I don't know. It's kind of pros and cons. Like I said, like now that I'm getting to the end of it, I'm like, well, what if they didn't see something on the ultrasound or what if something Mm -hmm. happens that, you know, but for the most part, what we see is normal, physiologic, beautiful deliveries and just counting on that for myself too. Um, and it helps that I get to kind of deliver with my work family. So I'm looking forward to that as well. That's awesome. I love that. Cause I mean, a lot of what I talk about on the podcast here, it has to do with like your birth support and creating your birth team and what that looks like. And so, yeah, I, I love that you have that set already in your birth space. That's really neat. Plus you've probably had an opportunity to go through the different doctors that you wanted and like, right. who, yes, I feel <laughs> very awesome. fortunate to have, you know, to have this as a background and yes, be able to pick from all of the providers. And even like my nurse friends are like, you know, even if I'm not working, call me and I'll come in and you know what I mean? So very fortunate. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, the other thing, sorry, just before we like jump into like the actual outline, but something you had mentioned in our call, like before we had officially decided, yeah, we're going to do this. You were talking about like the hospital that you work at, and I'm not going to have you like give personal details or anything like that here, but how you're like, I didn't know any other way. Will you talk about just the benefits of the location that you're at and kind of explain what exists out there for moms who are like, oh, I am so far from that. I didn't know that that was a real thing because I just listening to you talk about it and I was like, yes, I would like to direct women to that location, you know? So like how do women find that and what does it look like when it's a good space? So this is another reason why I'm so excited to talk about this because I feel like in certain spaces, hospitals get kind of demonized in, in recent, um, conversation about it and, you know, regarding birthing in hospitals, um, which I totally understand why that happens. I've heard horror stories of things still going on in hospitals routinely, like not allowing women to get out of bed once just because there's water, their water is broken, which I can't believe is still happening in 2022. So I totally get why that happens, but it also can be problematic for moms who maybe a home birth isn't an option for them. They're not a candidate for a home birth or a birthing center birth. They maybe are at higher risk and maybe the hospital birth is their only option. So, you know, I don't want those women to be scared and automatically think they've got to be on the defensive and, you know, these are my only options for a hospital birth. So um, I just want to get the message out that there are good hospitals out there. There's national initiatives and a national um, push for hospitals to be better. Um, And so one of the big ways that they're doing that is there's there's a national initiative to lower the um, NTSV cesarean rate. So what that stands for is Nola Paris. So first time, um, delivering moms. Um, I always forget what the other ones mean. I had to write it down. Uh, Nola Paris, um, singleton, singleton. So, you know, not a multiple birth, um, a vertex. So head down and then term. So greater than 37 weeks. Um, and the national benchmark for this is 23 points. Point four. So um, everybody, the hospitals, what you want to look for is a hospital that has an NTSV rate that is below that. And I know it seems like it's still kind of high, but it also includes higher risk pregnancies. So it's not just low risk pregnancies. It includes people who need to be induced for medical indications, um, you know, at early term. So at 37 weeks when your body's not ready and we can throw everything that we want at it, but, you know, for whatever reason is unsuccessful. So it kind of leaves space within that number for those higher risk um, people. But my hospital has been successful. Um, we're consistently below that number for the year. Um, I think a couple of times last year we were, um, I think our lowest was just below 5%. Um, so we were celebrated for that. And I think that happened on two different occasions. So I actually just participated in a research group or a focus group from a research company in Illinois um, who wanted to know from hospital birth workers who have taken part in um, a success at lowering their NTSV rate and kind of wanted to know about the culture of the unit and how we got that accomplished so that they could extend that um, to their hospital system as well. So there is, you know, a national push for 
better obstetric care in hospitals and for doing more natural things um, and changing the culture of the birthing unit to support physiologic birth. And that's but I feel like where I, I come from. I want to have a whole <laughs> podcast episode on that once you started talking about it. That's so interesting. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. I love, and I love the idea of like the focus group and like passing on information. And, you know, yeah. I feel like that's that's where it needs to be. Um, gosh, I have a lot of questions regarding that. <laughs> I'm like, let's stick to the plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, so I think cool, that there's though. a big, I think there's a big chunk of the stuff that we have that kind of ties into that a little bit and how I agree. Yeah. we kind of I get agree. that done. It does make me curious though. So you had talked about, you know, these rates of NTSV specifically and including high risk. Is there, do they have a separate one for women who are low risk and not induced in all of that or not? And why wouldn't they? I don't think so. And I'm not sure, to be honest. I think that when you ask for a provider's C-section rate, at least where I am, I think that most of our providers being asked are reporting their NTSV rate because that's that's pretty much what people I think I think it's the World Health Organization that um, puts it in quote unquote layman's terms and calls it low risk cesarean rate, but it's not really low risk. I mean, um, yeah, because it does include those like medical inductions and things like that. But yeah, I guess that's interesting. Because yeah. that's something that I've said, you know, when you're asking a provider cesarean rate, I've said it on the podcast, we say in the birth course, make sure that you're asking. It's not just, hey, what's your cesarean rate? It's, right. hey, for a woman like me, whether that's low risk or high risk or gestational diabetes or whatever, and how many babies I've had and all this, what does your cesarean rate look like for that? Um, and Absolutely. getting a little more specific. So, yeah, I think all of that matters. Yeah. All right. Let's dive in to the actual ideas we had behind the podcast. This is like, I'm like, we could just talk about whatever all day long and I would be super happy about that. But like you said, I think it's all going to go together and that has me really excited. Um, Mm -hmm. We kind of started off with this like birth plans. So, and for those of you that are listening, I've got some neat downloads for you guys today. We've actually created a visual birth plan that we're going to give you a link to so that you can just drag and drop things to create your own birth plan. Although I'm going to say all of this and be really excited about it. And then I'm going to ask Courtney about her birth plan stuff. And she's going to be like, well, don't do this. And I'll be like, you know what? Never mind. Forget the download. Um, But, and then also I'm going to make sure that we include that birth bag checklist again, because I know a lot of you were interested in that. And I feel like they kind of go hand in hand. Some of the things are going to relate to what you have on the birth plan and whatnot. But yes, let's talk about birth plans from a nurse's perspective, because I know the information that I give and I like I know everybody should know by now, like you don't print something off that has a checklist and it's six pages long and like, you know, you're going to drive somebody nuts. But how do they, the listeners today, how do they get across um, the birth that they're looking for without being snotty about it or um, feeling like you're railroading any nurses and presenting it in a way that's going to be respected um, and hopefully received really well and supported. What does that look like for moms creating a birth plan? So I love that you brought up specifically not being snotty. <laughs> um, I think that your that your episode on creating a birth plan and being concise and being one page, I think that that was really helpful for your listeners. Um, I have on occasion had a couple of um, moms who bring in birth plans, and I don't even know if they. I don't think they, they could have even possibly have created them. I think that it was like a, a download thing a from, template. from, yeah, from Google. Um, and it was, some of them are just really like, I remember one, it was literally like 20 pages long. Like the stapler was having trouble hold like the staple no. <laughs> couldn't even hold it together. <laughs> and it was like, um, you know, I want X, Y, Z. And then under it, there was a whole paragraph that was like, because research has shown that yada, 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 yada. And I'm like, we know what the research has shown. And all this research has shown is from 1997. So we have better research now that agrees with this point. You didn't need to do the whole thing. So I think keeping it clear and concise and, and knowing, um, kind of what the norm is for the hospital. So I think you had even mentioned in your, um, episode that like it, for example, if it's a baby friendly hospital, that includes X, Y, Z, you know, the golden hour, the skin to skin and the rooming in, not separating mom and baby for any reason, unless it's absolutely medically necessary and um, all of those things. So then you don't need to worry about those. You don't need to put them in your birth plan. Um, I mean, you can, but 
I find that 99% of the time, most of the birth plan is things like that. And I mean, Mm -hmm. I do come from a baby friendly hospital, so I can be like, great, we already do these things anyway. Um, But certain things like, um, I mean, that's really most of what a birth plan is. This, they want to do the skin to skin and the delayed cord clamping and the, the things that we already really do. Um, but I think just knowing your options and knowing what's the norm and then always, you know, keeping it short and concise. And if you have a backup plan, um, then we can discuss that as well. But I think um, short and concise. Yeah. And so by backup plan, do you mean like a cesarean plan? Yeah, that too. That would be helpful. I've actually never seen somebody who plans on coming in with a vaginal birth with a backup cesarean plan. But yeah, really? because that's yeah, oh, they I have should. never. They absolutely yeah. should. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, because we do offer all of those, you know, the the quote unquote gentle cesarean um things that we can kind of add on to the surgery. So like the clear drape, um, and we can um do the skin to skin in the OR and things like that. So yeah, absolutely. Um a backup plan as far as cesareans go. Um, and then even for moms who are like planning to have a home birth, I feel like they should huge come with, you know, because w- if they do get transferred, just have a backup yeah. plan for if you get transferred to the hospital for what you would like in the hospital. Yeah. And okay. That was like one of my topics that I was like, okay, I want a whole podcast episode on like transfers from (laughs) home birth to this, but it's moving so naturally. I just have a couple of questions. So because that got brought up here, um, for moms that are, have you had moms that have a backup birth plan and have not, or have you just not seen a backup birth plan when they come in? No. And it's almost like they come in immediately like you can tell that they, that this wasn't even on their radar, that they had no idea that this was ever even a possibility. And it's almost like they come in on the defensive immediately. And they're like, you want to give me a C-section and you want to, I'm like, no, we don't. (laughs) So I think just knowing what to expect or even like, you know, planning for that, um, as you're planning your own birth. So like knowing, you know, you're planning for this home birth, but doing the hospital tour anyway, or, um, you know what I mean? To kind of know what to expect for if that is, if that were to happen, certain things like, um, you know, they come in and they still expect their home birth midwife to be able to manage their labor, Mm. um, which they don't have privileges at the hospital. So that's not a possibility. Unfortunately, Um, we welcome them as a visitor and a participant, you know what I mean? But um, I mean, things that they're surprised about is even like they're, they're, they don't want an IV put in, but typically yeah. when they're being transferred, it's either for it's an for emergency help. or right. because they want pain management. Yeah. So. No, I think that's a really good point. And a hundred percent, um, maybe I haven't actually had like a podcast episode about that specifically. And as we're talking about this, it's making me realize I could, it'd be a really great benefit to moms who are looking to home birth for me to do that. I do talk about this in the birth course and I go over transfer and all that kind of stuff. But, um, one thing I hadn't put in there and I love that you just said that. And it's just like, duh, why isn't that in there is taking the hospital tour. Like, yes, if you're going to transfer to a hospital, you should know what that hospital looks like. Um, exactly. you know, meet the people, ask the questions just as if you were giving birth there. What are you going to have to, you know, maybe, um, be a little more vocal about or clear about versus, you know, like if all this stuff is normal anyways, or knowing that the IV is coming, I think that's huge. Yes. When you're transferring, it's for some kind of help and support and IV is probably going to be like number one on the list, you know? Right. So anyways, I, yeah, that, that kind of stuff is huge. And I am very serious. Like at some point, either you and I, or I, we're going to have to like sit down and like go over a home birth and transfer and all that stuff. And I love hearing about it from your perspective because yeah. I think, yeah, that attitude on the way in. And it makes me feel like as we're talking about that, there's probably a gap between um, out of hospital providers and their clients if they're coming in feeling like they have to have their fists up and they don't know what's coming. Um, I feel like there's a gap. So that's something if you're listening to this here, you're planning for a home birth, this is a conversation to have with your current out of hospital provider. What is to be expected? Should we transfer everything A to Z? So thank you for bringing that up. That is awesome. Yeah. And we, like I said, we want those midwives and those out of hospital providers to come because they can provide a better history as to what went on in the labor and why they're here. Um, we right. had one just a couple of weeks ago, I feel like where the midwife didn't come and we couldn't get a hold of her and it was just bizarre, um, and made yeah. it really difficult to, you know, 
adequately yeah. help the patient. Well, yeah. And that needs to be on the list of questions too. Do you transfer with me? Right. Because that's also, that's for mom too. It's not, I mean, yes, it's for the medical people. I think that makes it a ton more easy. Like, yes, they do have to transfer you with a certain amount of information and packet stuff. And you know, this packet goes with mom so that they have right. information, but how much smoother of a transition for a mom, if she's been working with this woman in the most vulnerable time and that she moves into this hospital space, you know, a, a space that she wasn't expecting to be and just to change a location to have that support, I think is huge. And that's, I mean, this is why I'm like, get a doula. Always make sure you have a doula. Like the doula goes with you everywhere. They don't work for any provider. Like this is your personal little like safety bubble, you know, (laughs) but, but having a midwife that transfers with you, I mean, that would be my recommendation and what I would want for my birth as well. Like I want that provider that's going to follow me through, even if they're not going to take over the care at the hospital, even just for a small amount of time, just to feel like safe and comfortable and everything is cool, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah. Um, talking about hospital tours, though, um, because you you had mentioned this, and I know that we're talking about it even for home birth. I you you said something about making sure that you're asking questions where you're going to be delivering, and you're like, that's just as important as interviewing a provider. Will you talk to me about why that is? And I, if you have it off the top of your head, what are you thinking some of the most important questions for women to ask are at that hospital tour? Yeah. So I think it's just as important as interviewing a provider because I feel like the 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 whole culture of the unit um, kind of goes hand in hand with what you can expect from a provider. I think it would be really rare to find, um, you know, a birthing unit who's all about promoting physiologic birth and minimizing the risk of C-section and minimizing interventions, and then find this provider who is like, you know, over intervention and wants to medically induce or non-medically induce everybody and, and, you know, C-section happy and things like that. So, um, and also I feel like, um, the providers, depending on the type of hospital, so how much volume they do, um, on the unit, it's it's the nurses and nursing management that pretty much run the that unit and that shape the culture of the unit. The doctors contribute as well, absolutely. But depending on how much volume you do, like on my unit, we have... Um, like 10 ish providers. So we have really great report with that rapport with them. We spend a lot of time with them, but however, other hospitals who have many more providers and they're a lot busier, those providers, um, you know, probably they don't probably spend a lot of time there just to poke their heads in, catch a baby and then go back down to their office. Um, so they might not know the answer to a lot of these questions, um, that you would want to know about the unit. So, we already talked about the NTSV rate. I feel like that is um, a good indicator of the culture of the unit and whether or not that matches up with your goals and your values. So that's an important um, thing to ask. Um, also, I think it's a good idea to to schedule a tour um, as opposed to just dropping in. I know a lot of places will let you do that, but I think if you schedule it ahead of time, um, you'll be able to ask the questions that you want to ask and have somebody devoted to spending that time with you and you won't feel so rushed in addition to the NTSV rate. So you'll want to ask about if the hospital has any tools, um, like birthing support tools to help you accomplish that goal. If your goal is to avoid a C-section or your goal is to have the most natural birth possible, what do they have to support that? Um, So like, for example, for my hospital, as part of the whole, the lowering the NTSB rate was called the provide initiative. So we came up with these provide carts and they're stocked with all kinds of fun things, um, essential oils, the ones that are evidence-based to um, help in labor. So I think it's like the, the lemongrass and the peppermint and the lavender diffusers. We also have little tea light candles and then comfort things like little massage balls, um, stress balls, the combs. I think you've touched on those, I think, in, in one of your episodes, the combs, yeah. um, chapstick, things like that. Um, and then like birthing balls, yoga mats, rebozos, peanut balls. And that way, if there's anything that you are really wanting to use in labor and your unit doesn't offer those, then you can plan on um, bringing those with you to the hospital. And then certain policies. So like, depending on who's giving you the tour, it might be a nurse or a a volunteer. Um, But if, if whoever's giving you the tour doesn't have the answer to the question, you can always request to speak with a nurse or nursing management, because those are going to be the positions that are most um, knowledgeable about hospital policies. 
and these are certain things that you can ask your provider too. So like things about continuous monitoring, if you're a low risk and you're not being induced, you need to be on the monitors or can you do intermittent monitoring so that you're able to move around more freely or do they have portable monitoring that's available or birthing tubs or what are the, in, what um, are contraindications of allowing me to get in a birthing tub? Can I get in if I have, if I'm GBS positive or if my water is broken and then yeah, like the policies about IV if you're low risk um, and things like that. I just think that there are certain things like that are more are better answered by the unit itself because of the hospital policy, the knowledge of the hospital policies, um, as opposed yeah. to just interviewing your provider. Okay, so help me out with hospital policies here, and this is certainly something I've talked about, um, but policies exist and it's the hospital's policy. If a mom chooses, she still doesn't want to do something. What does that look like for mom? Yeah. So typically, I mean, we, mom, we can't put an IV in a mom if we, if she refuses an IV, which I don't even think that we have a policy that specifically states that every mom has to have an IV, but, um, but yeah, typically you can refuse just about anything. Um, However, there are certain things that we can't do in response to that. So like if you're refusing an IV, okay, we can't induce you because right. we don't have, you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> but I mean, if you're in your own natural labor, you know, and we're not doing anything to you, we're not giving you any medications to increase your contractions or anything like that, then yeah. Um, so yeah, so she can um, refuse, even if it goes against hospital policy, we just have to document that she refused it and then plan the rest of our care accordingly. Okay. Excellent. You'd also talked about even asking, and I love this question, um, but like, how about the nurses and the staff? Are they trained or familiar with unmedicated birth and like what kind of hands-on tools and um, support are they able to give? So do you have any questions that way for the staff that moms might be able to ask other than just the like tools and support? Yeah. So I would ask if the nurses are specifically trained in hands-on labor support, um, which I didn't, like I said, this is the only hospital I've ever worked at. This is the only labor and delivery environment I've ever been in. So when I hear things from other hospitals, like I think I was listening to another podcast. I think it, I don't remember which one it was, but the the host had said like, yeah, labor and delivery nurses aren't really trained in, in labor support. And I'm like, what? Yeah, we are. But I mean, I guess some places they're not. So, um, so I would ask that, um, a, a good, you could ask if they're trained in spinning babies. That's like a really like popular, yeah. um, movement going on right now is the spinning babies, which, um, we, we aren't mandated to be trained in spinning babies, but a lot of us have opted to take the course and my organization, um, pays for the course and pays us to take it. So that's awesome. Yeah. So that's really great. Um, and then you could always ask about like, um, staffing ratios. They're not always going to be able to give you, you know, it depends on what's going on, on, on any given day in a labor and delivery unit, but they can kind of give you an idea like of how much time a nurse, um, typically is able to spend with a labor, with a laboring patient. Um, and sometimes that can, we love doulas too. Um, but you know, sometimes depending, um, you know, we're able to offer some of that type of support, which is, which is always great. Yeah. That's excellent. I also wanted to talk about vaginal birth and you had some ideas and thoughts behind what you've seen that can make that successful. So will you speak to that just a little bit? Yeah. So I think from what I've seen, the number, th the number one thing that you can do to increase your chances of a successful vaginal normal physiologic birth and the best satisfaction with your experience is beginning pregnancy in a place of health um, and continuing that throughout your pregnancy. And I know that it's hard. Pregnancy is not, I'm not one of those pregnant people who feels beautiful and sexy and has all the energy in the world. And it's hard, but, um, you know, focusing on nutrition and especially activity, um, to kind of keep yourself healthy, um, because you want to avoid, uh, you want to avoid medical induction for any reason. Now that's not to say, you know, you can take the best care of yourself throughout pregnancy and something can still happen that's unavoidable and that's not your fault. Um, however, beginning with, you know, a healthy body weight, balanced nutrition, regular exercise routine that can help, um, 
you know, knock off some of those risk factors that put you at risk for a medical induction. And the reason that I say this is because I think that, I don't know if there's any research behind this. This is just my feeling and what I've seen in the hospital. But I feel like one of the number one hindrances to a normally progressing um, labor is, and the bane of my existence, is continuous fetal monitoring. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, that being said, if we're inducing you for a medical reason, if we're inducing you at all, you have to be on continuous fetal monitoring. So I think that if you can avoid that in any way, then you're helping to set yourself up for success. Um, with the monitoring, I remember when I first took the spinning babies course and I was like, I told my instructor, I was like, all these things are so great, all these different positions, but like, I could never monitor a patient in that position for any extended period of time. I think it's, ridiculous that we're still using the same mode of monitoring to monitor women in 2022. And then it makes it more difficult for patients with certain complications or like a higher BMI. They're even more difficult to monitor with the external monitors. And then they've got a, they're kind of even at more of a loss because they've got to stay still or in a certain position to be monitored, but then we want their labor to progress, but then they can't because they're not moving. And it's just kind of a, you know, you want to avoid that if all possible. So on the same token, avoiding a non-medical induction, pretty much every provider is going to offer you a elective induction around 39 weeks if your cervix is favorable. And I would just say, wait it out a little bit if you can. Um, just because it's better for everyone involved. Your risk of a cesarean section is lower um, and your chances of a more satisfactory, comfortable birth experience are higher, I think. Yeah, I'm totally with you on that. I have a big problem with the amount of induction that is offered at 39 weeks. And even here, like me saying offered and you saying elective, and it's like, that's not how it's presented. You know, it's like, well, let's schedule your induction. (laughs) What? Yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. what are we talking about? Um, talk to me about, I love this. I know this. I've seen it as a doula. I do, Professionally, like for sure this exists. What is it about continuous fetal monitoring that makes the difference other than just like you're saying the positions and such where mom can't be into a better position that allows baby to move through her pelvis? Well, they're uncomfortable, first of all. Um, and a lot of times they don't you can't monitor in a lot of different positions, especially for um, the moms with, you know, the higher BMI, it's, it's even more difficult to, to monitor them with those. And I feel like it's, like I said, it's just so ridiculous that this is what we're still using to monitor women. I feel like it wouldn't be that difficult to create just like a stronger, whatever they're called. I'm not a technological person, but like a stronger ultrasonic waves that can detect a fetal heart rate. But I don't know. They're still using whatever they used 20 years ago, I guess. Do you find that um, this has been my personal experience? Do you find that it picks up things that look emergent that aren't emergent or that wouldn't have been caught without the continuous part of the fetal monitoring? It can. And there is research that shows that continuous fetal monitoring does lead to more intervention, a higher rate of cesarean section. And I think I read a higher rate of um, like vacuum and forceps assisted deliveries as well. Um, But I think that's more of, well, yeah, I mean, you, it, sometimes it picks up things that aren't really accurate, but I feel like if you've got an RN or, you know, providers that are skilled in fetal monitoring, like you start to pick up on like the, the little um, glitches and things like that. Like, oh, I know that it looks like baby's heart rate is low, but that's just because mom is sitting up. Let me go adjust her or, you know, things like that. I I think you're right. I think the um, labor and delivery nurse can make a huge difference in that case. I've seen both sides, um, someone who, you know, seasoned and they get it and they're like, oh, well, just let's switch sides and see how baby does. Don't worry about it. I'll come back. Let me turn that down. So you're not worried about the sound. And then the other side of like, that's not looking good and paging the doctor. And I'm over here like, I'm not a birth professional like that way. I'm not medical at all. And I can't and won't say anything in that regard. But I'm thinking, don't you want to try a different position or like, you know, see if something else changes? Um, So, yeah, I think that kind of stuff matters for sure. And just I don't know, even like you're talking about like having somebody who's experienced it for a while and they get it and they can say it's normal. Let's try this before the like, oh, no, (laughs) things are going south, you know. Yeah, Um, absolutely. And then also with the monitors, some hospitals, 
um, like we have a little portable you, where you can at least connect our old ancient monitors to portable, <laughs> um, a portable little box that like hangs on the IV pole. So you can like walk yeah. around the unit while you're being monitored. But a lot of places, um, and I didn't realize this either until we just recently, um, one of my coworkers, she was saying that where she came from, they didn't have any way to monitor women remotely. So they were literally confined to the bed for the most part, or, you know, the immediate area around the bed where the monitors would reach. So, um, which is just, I mean, women need to be able to move and and change positions and things like that to keep their labor going. Right. And I mean, that's an excellent question to ask in that hospital tour, you know, what kind of monitoring do you have? Do you have a wireless option? I love that. Um, or at least a mobile option like you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Um, you mentioned also, you talked about induction, And um, I know we had this on for discussion as well, like what are realistic expectations? And so this is certainly something I talk about, um, you know, just like you had said, like if you come in and you're wanting to be in your own clothes and you don't want an IV and like, you know, hands off kind of whatever, that's great. But should we choose to do some of these other things that require medical intervention in one way or another, whether that's increasing induction um, or contractions with Pitocin or you choose that you want to have some kind of medication, whether that's an epidural or a local anesthetic, like those things require that now, like you're basically signing some things that say, and for this reason, for the safety of mom and baby, because we're administering these things, X, Y, and Z has to happen. That's just the way it is for safety of mom and baby. So will you talk about that in regards to induction, what that looks like for mom, elective or not? Yeah. So having like you said, just having realistic expectations. So if your provider is either offering an an elective induction to you and you opt for that, or if your provider is saying you've got X, Y, Z going on, and I really think that the best um, option for us would be to induce, you can ask, how will that change my birth plan? These things that I wanted, like not wanting an IV or things like that. Um, If we're inducing you for a medical reason, you've got to have an IV. You know, we have to have a plan in place for for emergencies because if, you know, induction does carry certain risks with it in and of itself and IV access is a safety precaution in case something did go down or were to turn emergent very quickly. Um, so that's one thing that you're probably not going to get out of with um, any type of induction. And then... I think you've talked about before how Pitocin can increase the discomfort of labor very quickly. Um, So if you um, were sure before that you didn't want an epidural or you're not sure about the other pain management options, maybe asking for more information about those so that you have all of the information to make an informed decision if you are finding that you are not dealing with the discomfort as well as you thought that you would. Yeah. If you're one, if you do decide that you want an epidural, um, understanding all of the things that come along with that as well, which is pretty much everything, you'll be hooked up to to almost everything that we have um, if you want an epidural. And that's that is for safety purposes as well. Um, You know, we monitor your, your oxygenation with the pulse ox cord, the blood pressure cuff goes off more frequently because the epidural can tend to drop your blood pressure. You can't get out of bed to go to the bathroom. So there's generally a Foley catheter involved. Um, so understanding that also, um, typically we do have our moms watch like a whole, we have a whole separate educational video on the epidural that we like them to watch, but sometimes things happen so quickly and they, they don't get to it. Um, and I try my best to, to, specifically go over all of those things with them. Um, But sometimes I've had once or twice where a patient gets the epidural and then they're so confused that they can't move their legs and they don't like it. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Well, we should have, we should have discussed that. (laughs) What Um, did we think the epidural was going to (laughs) do? Exactly. (laughs) Right. So, so just, yeah. So just kind of educating yourself as much as possible about all of the different scenarios um that can come up that are on here and you're not sure if your legs are going to move after an epidural or not it's time to take a birth course (laughs) yeah (laughs) yes a birth course oh I feel like I love the age that we live in there are alternative options so like there's YouTube videos and there's podcasts and things like that which is really great for moms who either they don't have time or money to take a birth course but I feel like 
at least one full comprehensive birth course yeah. for everyone. And then even like a specialty one, like hypnobirthing or spinning babies or whatever, something else. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I I feel like, you know, the, I, even if I were to be pregnant again, I you can't learn enough. There's just like exactly. so so much good information out there and and so much knowledge that we can learn. Like yes, it's true that birth doesn't change in like the physiological sense of like we have a uterus and it's made to grow a baby and it's also made to contract and get the baby out. But like how we approach birth, I think just the more the more you learn, the better and more capable you're going to be able to um, be in that space for yourself. And that looks different for every woman. So and and even for every birth, like what speaks to me, you know, spoke to me at, at one stage of my life, I may have gathered some information from there to bring to the next stage. And so I am with you. I think the more you can learn, the better. Um, exactly. Before we jump off, you had a couple of things on here. So you had like dads, like here's some important things for birth partners. Um, and I put my favorite two at the end. So you go ahead and talk about a couple of these, um, where you're like, this is my best advice for dads coming into the birth space in a hospital setting. And then I have some questions. (laughs) So do not, we really want you to be hands-on and supportive. It makes me, it kind of like breaks my heart in a way when I see dads like you know, she's in pain and she's really working through contractions and she's in her zone. And I see dads like off in the corner on their phone or even worse, like playing video games. And Mm. I don't know what world they are living in to think that they can bring a big screen TV and an Xbox into the birth space and play that while their wife is giving birth. It's so confusing to me. I mean, it's one thing if you're planning like a really, you know, you know, you know, you that you're in for a long induction and mom also likes to play Mario Kart or something. And you guys can play that together. But any solo activity, especially if it's electronic and something that she's not into, don't bring it. And you look ridiculous carrying a 55 inch television down the hallway in the (laughs) hospital. (laughs) Tell me this has happened and this is why you're telling me like you've personally yeah, seen this. Stop. Absolutely. I'm dying. And then um, I've also had dads um, bring in coolers full of beer. Um, I had a, a one night my patient was she wasn't in active labor. I still don't think that's an excuse, but she was trying to sleep and he was up watching the news and and I go to empty the trash and it's full of Coors Light beer cans. So. <laughs> I'm not sure why. I mean, it's a hospital. You just would think that you would know that that's off limits. And then um, I feel like there's, there's, um, don't smoke in the bathroom. There's a lot of people that try to smoke, smoke weed in the bathroom. And I'm like, we weren't born yesterday. You know, we can smell it. That was the one that I was like, and all of them, all of them. I'm like, this can't be real. But I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah, they do that. They do. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> what do you do? What do you do as a labor and delivery nurse? I just above my pay grade. I just tell my charge nurse and they can, that's up to them at that point. <laughs> oh my goodness. Can you imagine as a woman? Well, first anyways, as a woman in labor and the charge nurse is having to come talk to your husband because it, like, hello, talk about not yeah. being able to focus on your birth. I know. Oh my gosh. Okay, so it made me before we jump off, like seriously, I'm like, okay, because you just added in these couple little things. I'm like, I want to hear from you. And it doesn't have to be something that dramatic, which I think is just hilarious. You must have the best stories. Um, But what is like a memory or something that's like really stood out to you can be positive, funny, crazy, weird, whatever. What's something that's really stood out to you since working as a labor and delivery nurse within the hospital you're in? I think I've noticed more since I've become pregnant, I think what has been really special to me is how much that I've been empowered by not only just like, I feel like my coworkers are such an inspiration to me because they're super strong women. Um, you know, they're all great moms and, um, really successful at what they do, but my patients as well, um, you know, they have helped me to feel empowered and giving birth again and to not feel Mm -hmm. scared and, I always love those days where I get to be involved in a really powerful, particularly powerful birth experience that makes me feel confident, makes me feel like, okay, I can do this again. Um, I had one not too long ago. So since I've been pregnant and she had had a really traumatic birth experience the first time around and she 
this was, um, she had wanted to do it unmedicated, but she did end up getting her epidural. And at that point she was, she, I mean, she could have pushed her baby out super quickly, but she was like, no, I think I'm going to take a nap. And I was like, oh, okay. What, you know, just asked her why she felt like she wanted to take a nap. And she's like, you know, she had a really bad, um, like laceration the last time around. And it was really traumatic for her. And I had kind of a similar experience. So, you know, I was like, okay, just so you know, this, you, she, she was telling me how she pushed for so long the last time and it was traumatic and like, okay, just so you know, your baby's right there. So you could do this. But she's like, no, I think I'm just going to take a nap. And so I'm like, okay. So she did for two hours. And I mean, the strip looked, her baby's heart rate looked fine and there was no indication that we need to get things going. And it just ended up being the most beautiful delivery with a completely intact perineum. And it just was really inspiring for me. And I was like, I'm going to do that when I give birth. <laughs> I'm going to get my epidural and I'm going to lay her down for two hours and I'm going to have a better experience this time around. <laughs> I love so that. I learned, yeah. That so I learned a lot from my comes patients. From that. Yeah. yeah. And I think you're speaking to just some really um, deep wisdom and truth right now, which is, you know, birth has become more medicalized and, um, you know, we do it at hospital instead of home and stuff. And just kind of going back to like earlier roots, how important it is that we talk about and see natural, good, positive um, birth experiences um, and that doesn't mean necessarily unmedicated, just like you were talking about, but a woman that knows what she wants, she's confident in making her decision and she feels safe and supported in doing that. So that's huge. Like I think about my kids, I do have three boys, so it is what it is, but I've thought, you know, if I get into birth work on the side of midwifery or something like that, how much I want my children to be involved and to understand like this is normal, it's natural, it's beautiful. This is like it is such a sacred space to be in that, you know, you get to work in or that I've been in with these women bringing these babies, these bright new souls earthside and watching the power behind that, the power mm-hmm. and the strength and um the sacrifice that mom is making to be able to do that. It's incredible. And with a birth partner too, so note to dads, right? With a birth partner that is present and supportive and knows what to do and is able to be kind of hands-on or, I mean, even if you don't have those hands-on skills to be sitting next to your wife or this woman in front of you that um, you're having this baby together and really support her from a place of love and caring and, and what she needs in that moment. And when you, I think too, like as a mom, when you are supported that way and bringing this baby into the world, like you're more confident as a mother, you're more in love with that experience. It bonds you to the people around around you. I mean, even my doula, you know, I had one doula on my third birth. I would assume it's the same thing with the labor and delivery nurses. Like these people are there for such a small amount of time with you. And yet you were like connected to them forever. You feel like I could not have had this experience without this person in my space. And that's yeah. such a really neat thing to be a part of. And that's why I love labor and delivery nursing. I feel like it's so much more gratifying than maybe other areas Mm -hmm. of nursing because you can participate in these life-changing moments for women and for couples. And they're so much more appreciative of the work that you do. And they always, I have trouble remembering, even if I have like super memorable experiences with patients, I have so many of them that it's, it's hard to remember all of them, but they remember you. And so yeah. I feel like that's super special. Like, I don't remember mine even eight years ago. I don't remember her name, but if I saw her in a crowd somewhere, I would know who she was. Yeah, that's huge. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for the work that you do. I think you are empowering women and the support that you give is just wonderful. Um, I know that the women that you're dealing with are absolutely being touched by your spirit and your knowledge and your skills. So I'm grateful for that. And I also, I also want to thank you for being here on the podcast because now thousands and thousands of women get to hear from you and get to be a part of that. So Um, And I want to wish you a congratulations early, but hopefully soon (laughs) for this baby that's on the way. I hope you have an awesome, incredible birth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been amazing. And I love the work that you're doing as well and getting this information out to um, moms. And I think that you've got a lot to offer in your birth course as well. But even just, just the information that you offer in your podcast, I feel like you touch on all the right topics and it's clear and concise and digestible bits of information so that even 
even as like a standalone, the podcast functioned so well um, to get that education into the hands of women everywhere. So thank you. Well, thank you.